Okay, this is Mr. Williams. Uh, another flipped classroom presentation. This one I'm dealing with Milton's, oopsie, Milton's introduction to Satan in book one, um, especially Satan's most famous speech. Uh, when we left off, uh, Satan and Beelzebub were lying on the burning lake of hell, contemplating what to do. Satan has asked Beelzebub, what could we do? It's a given that they're going to resist. They're going to fight God in some way, shape, or form. And yet, paradoxically, they've just been uh, given a smashing, profound defeat. So, in your books, you should turn to... Uh, lines 242 through 272, this famous passage. And uh, Milton's poem, I mean, in Milton's poem, clearly there is a lot of description. Some of it is beautiful, although clearly some of it is very challenging as well. But there's a lot of description that comes from Milton the poet. But much of the narrative actually moves forward through dramatic speeches by characters and dialogue, uh, although it's usually not that fast, zippy back and forth that some of us like. And this is a prime example of that, uh, a famous speech from Satan, a rhetorical situation of it. Satan, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Beelzebub. Uh, on what occasion? Having been smashed down into hell, heaven, I mean smashed down into hell and suffering a dramatic uh, defeat. What's his purpose? Well, what's he going to do about it? So Satan's uh, use of uh, sophisticated rhetorical style uh, intensifies two powerful assertions. He states, lines 254 through 55, that heaven and hell are essentially states of mind. Now, from a human perspective, that is something that most of us can probably relate to if we're thinking of heaven and hell metaphorically. No human being, if they're a living human being, can have experienced a literal heaven or a literal hell. Milton has Satan saying that these places are states of mind, ironically, even though he, the character of Satan, has experienced both of them. And so that makes an interesting twist that deepens this idea, which is already a deep idea, then heaven and hell are states of mind, essentially saying that our power over our attitude is the greatest power any of us have. And the second uh, powerful assertion he makes in line 263 is that it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And if we take the metaphor in that line, it's better to reign. Well, if you reign, you are the king. You are the boss. You are autonomous. You are the individual that's in charge. And serving, well, obviously, uh, service is a virtue, and we all give it, um, there's some service that is given freely, and then there's some ser service that is uh, either forced or coerced, and that hit changes the whole nature of what service is. Critics have said Milton invests Satan with dignity and power here in this first speech too much, makes him too relatable to his human audience. Um, Satan's, I mean, excuse me, Milton's defenders would say, yes, but we are meeting Satan here in book one right after he has fallen. And so he is the most like his former self, which was admirable when he was Lucifer. He was the highest angel. But Milton's defenders would say, yeah, he's most like that now. You'll see how he develops, and over the course of the poem, he's, he, he doesn't have a lot of dignity and power later on. 
He's, he's not seen as a dignified character later on. So here are those lines. Um, Milton has Satan ask, is this the region? This the soil? This the climb? So I was like, so this is it, huh? This the seat that must change for heaven? This the mournful gloom for that celestial light? Be it so. So there's a sense of resolution that we can hear in Satan's voice. Since he who now is sovereign can dispose and bid what shall be right, so there's an acknowledgement right there of God's supremacy, farthest from him is best. So there's an acceptance. All right, we're far away from him that is sovereign. Whom reason hath equaled, force has made supreme above his equals. Farewell, happy fields. So here we have an apostrophe with Satan basically saying farewell to heaven and the loveliness of heaven. Farewell, happy fields, where joy forever dwells. And then another apostrophe, hail, horror, hail, the infernal world. Essentially, talking to hell, the literal setting in which he is. And he says, receive thy new possessor, one who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. Satan continues, The mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. Again, I've covered this in earlier, earlier in this uh, flipped classroom, but it's a very human thought. It's something that I can relate to. Satan continues, What matter where, if I be still the same, and what I should be, all but less than he the whom thunder hath made greater? Hmm. There he's saying that it's thunder. It's The only thing that makes God greater is God's thunder. Here at last we shall be free. The Almighty hath not built here, for his envy will not drive us hence. Here we may reign secure, and in my choice... To reign is worth ambition, though in hell. Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. You know, in some sense, it conjures up a an either-or construct or a, a declaration from an American patriot, give me liberty or give me death, saying, I will not serve. Patrick Kenny said, I'll choose death unless I can be free. So, um, after this most famous uh, passage, uh, Milton compares the legions of fallen angels to soldiers. Here, Milton is trying to follow upon, but even best, the epic conventions laid out by Homer and Virgil. 315 through 330, Satan calls on the demons to unite. Three thirty one to three forty six. Shamed by Satan's cry, the other angels spring to attention. So uh, here we have the leader of the fallen angels, Satan, who has caused them this terrible suffering, but using emotional manipulation to get the attention of the followers. So, begin, line 376, reinvoking his muse, Milton catalogs or lists the fallen angels, calling them by the names of pagan gods who figure in the Old Testament. This is working both because it was a convention of the epic poets. Homer and Virgil both did do these long lists of who were these uh, soldiers or who were these um 
uh, yeah, soldiers who were battling in the Trojan War. And Milton follows that, but he's also casting those pagan gods as basically devils. Anything that's any deity that's not a Christian deity is one of those demons. So Moloch is one of them, and we'll hear from him later on. Those are the lines on which you'll hear uh, the names of some of the ones that it might be worth remembering. And then moving into line 522 through 621, uh, Satan's followers gather before him, and three times he tries to speak to them, but tears such as angels weep burst forth. And here, the, the, obviously, the number three has very important symbolic significance to uh, Christians and in Christianity. And, so, and, and Milton knows that, so, you know, maybe it's just building up the suspense, trying to tell an exciting story. But um, it seems to be one of those places where his narrative uh, purpose is making his theological purpose murky. Uh, line 622 through 669, um, Satan repeats much of what he has already said to Beelzebub. He says they lost the battle, but not the war. He's trying to rally those that who have, follow, have followed him and then fallen because of him um, to still come behind him. Now, it's interesting because Satan has rebelled against the authority of God, and here is Satan using manipulation to gain authority over his followers. And here's where there's a plot twist um, in terms of the uh, plot triangle. Uh, here's a, a bit of a complication. We begin in Medius Res with Satan and the other demons cast out of heaven and living in hell, suffering but it's Satan who suggests that their defiance of God will take place in the new world. That's Earth. And uh, the timeline of Earth's creation compared to the war in heaven is a little bit complex. It's not exactly clear. It's, uh, Satan says, you know, says that it's a rumor that there's this new world with new creatures on it. And that brings upon some sibling rivalry that Satan will uh, have uh, when he will feel uh, jealous of the new creation um, when he hearkens back to how much God used to love him. But that's getting ahead of myself. And the book, uh, book one wraps up with Mammon, one of those pagan deities. Um, Mammon leading all the demons to erect pandemonium which is a, a word that Milton originated and created. And it's interesting because Milton has uh, described the geography of the physical place, hell, as being, well, there's lots of natural resources down there. And the natural resources are set. The demons construct this incredible palace. And we can see this image here of presumably Satan looking over the newly constructed pandemonium. Here's another image from another artist of, of Satan looking over this grand palace that now presumably he is going to take over. And that should do it for this one. I will try to create two more flip classrooms for book two. Bye-bye.